and welcome to HistFest 2021 and a warm welcome back to those of you who have weekend and day passes. My name is Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest and I am really, really excited to share with you the day's events. And um, We have a fantastic range of speakers and talks going on, so please check them out via the website www.histfest.org. Now, before we get started, there are just a couple of housekeeping points to note. Um, using the menu above, you can provide feedback um, on the event and also, if you wish, donate to the British Library. The Library is a charity and your support really does help to open up a world of knowledge and inspiration to everyone. Your feedback is also incredibly useful in helping to plan future cultural events. You can also find a tab um, with a link to the bookshop where you can browse a range of titles by the uh, festival authors. Now, at the end of the discussion, there'll be an opportunity to have a short audience Q&A. So please do submit your questions using the box below the video. Also below the video, you'll find further information about today's speakers, as well as social media links, um, should you wish to continue the conversation after the event. Now, I'm going to hand you over to our event sponsors to introduce you to the speakers for our next event, the House of Byron, Scandal, Fall and the Rise to Celebrity. Hello, I'm Dan Snow from History Hit. History Hit is a new history channel, a place where you can go and listen to audio, including interviews with all three of the wonderful guests in this session, and you can watch hundreds of hours of original history documentaries, like the one in which Britain's leading forensic anthropologist opened a coffin of a celebrated, infamous 18th century Highland chief to find out exactly who was in there and whether he had a head. Check out historyhit.tv. We're delighted to support the House of Byron scandal, fall and the rise of celebrity. This session features historian, broadcaster and author of Dead Famous, Greg Jenner, historian and author of The Fall of the House of Byron, Emily Brand, and it's chaired by broadcaster, historian and author of England's Mistress, The Infamous Life of Emma Hamilton, Professor Kate Williams. Enjoy. Hello and welcome everyone to our event, the House of Byron Scandal, Fall and the Rise to Celebrity. Thank you so much all for coming to invite us into your homes. We are absolutely so honoured to be with you. We're so grateful to History Hit for our sponsorship and to Rebecca for the, organising the wonderful History Hit and to the British Library for having us. It's so great to be with you. I'm just so excited to come to this event. It's you know completely up my street. Georgian celebrity. It's full of, we've got, I think we're going to have 40 minutes of scandal, eye-popping scandal. So hold on to your seats, you know, get ready, strap in because it's eye-popping scandal, exciting stuff. And then at um, 20 to 6, we'll have some questions and finish at 10 to 6 at 5.50. So I'm really excited to introduce this brilliant event. We've got two books. We've got, here is Emily Brand. It's wonderful to see Emily here, a historian and author. And there's the brilliant, The Rise and Fall of the House of Byron is her first book, Five Years of Research. I followed on Instagram all the different archives she went to, absolutely amazing. And, you know, it really is an 18th century delight full of so many stories. And she's busy working on her next book. It was Book of the Week on Radio 4 and superb family biography, so BBC History, and a ravishing family saga, so the Sunday Times. So, so go out and buy it if you haven't already. And um, it's also marvellous to see Greg Jenner here, my fellow presenting friend on Inside Versailles. We were in a freezing cold church talking about uh, sex and scandal in the French court. And now we're here in our nice cosier houses talking about um, sex and scandal in Georgian Britain. Here, his fantastic book, Dead Famous, An Unexpected History of Celebrity. Um, it says fizzes with big vignettes of the Guardian and juicy titbits, a joyous romp of a book, said the Guardian. And uh, the Irish Times, and I think my perhaps favourite review of Greg, said he was like an Oscar Wilde figure taking us through celebrity. Uh, Greg's next book is due out in November, uh, no, it's Oct October, Ask a Historian. And of course, he's always the, also the host of our beloved history, brilliant podcast, You're Dead to Me. So subscribe to that if you haven't already. Um, 
uh, you know, brilliant. So fantastic to be here. I've got so many questions to ask. I don't know whether I'm going to get through all of them. And I know your <laughs> questions as well. But Emily's book is such a revelation because, you know, we all have an idea, don't we, of Byron, mad, bad and dangerous to know. But who was to know that his family, you know, they were completely eye popping in their scandal as well. Uh, adultery, murder. It really shows what a what wild family he was part of. And so, Emily, if I could start with you, uh, what, what attracted you to write on this absolutely incredible family? Never a dull moment. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all those nice words, Kate. That was lovely of you. Um, yes, it actually, I mean, I, much, much of my work has been about love and sex and seduction in this era, in the long 18th century. So obviously Byron looms very large in that anyway. But what actually started me on this journey for writing this book was uh, a female character in the book Isabella who has been pretty much um, very well totally neglected since she died uh, and I saw a portrait of her as many historians may sympathize with me I was it was midnight and I was googling historical things and this portrait popped up by Thomas Gainsborough of uh, Isabella then Countess of Carlisle and I just totally fell in love with it and I was trying to find out more about her and there was very little um, online or seemingly in archives or anywhere about her. So I was just totally entranced. And then by seeing that her maiden name was Byron, this sent me down this rabbit hole of information about her siblings, about her nephew and her great nephew, who was the poet. And I just got caught in this mission of writing this, what was clearly a family saga um, and happily, when I started visiting the archives and digging things up about Isabella, she was just as interesting as the rest of them. So it was a bit of a win, really, for me. I, I, uh, they wouldn't leave me alone, and uh, ha I had to write it. So Isabella Byron, who, who was she? Can you write so brilliantly in the book about, you know, what traditional female education was? And Isabella mm -hmm. really wasn't having any of that traditional female role, was she? Uh, she was her own woman, for sure. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to... So it's to show without a family tree sometimes, but the book, my book is predominantly around the uh, generation of the poet's grandparents. So the poet's grandfather was um, a military adventurer and explorer in the Navy. Uh, his elder brother, William, was the fifth Lord Byron and their elder sister was Isabella. And I was just amazed on reading her letters and her general adventures through Europe, she basically ran through two husbands. She was known from her early 20s for her flirtations and her gallantries, which obviously for men at this time, totally fine. For women at this time, oh, you know, don't go there. But she got bored of her second husband and she skipped off to Europe where she took up with various young officers and uh, caused a sensation back at home earning herself the title Notorious Woman. Um, so obviously I just, I loved her. Um, but then she came home and wrote an etiquette guide and uh, this, this, <laughs> the seal was set really. I must, I must read that. I clearly have a lot to learn. I, I absolutely must read that etiquette guide. I really must. Yeah, fascinating. Greg, so if I could turn to you. So, so the Byrons, are they the epitome of, of the 18th century market celebrity world? That's a really good question. I think, um, I don't know how Emily feels about this, but I would say by and large, the Byrons are not celebrities. I think they're probably in a slightly different category, but I think perhaps Isabella and perhaps uh, by the poet's grandfather maybe sort of touches on it because of his, his sort of naval reputation, his heroics. Um, but fame and celebrity sort of interlock in complicated ways and celebrity is a bit different to fame and it's different to renown as well. And it's it's quite a long winded argument that I don't want to bore you with. But um, I think they're sort of fame adjacent. They're certainly sort of being discussed. I think people know of them, but their family's not quite. I mean, is it fair to say, Emily, the Byrons are not one of the great houses? Yeah, I, I mean, they're dangling at the bottom of the peerage, aren't they, really? They're mm. just barons and associated. Um, I, I'd agree. I think wh whatever we, we will go on to say about the poet in terms of celebrity, I think his grandfather, I, I would say he had a degree of fame. Mm -hmm. um, there were poems written about him. There were prints written about him. He was in the, the real life version of Lady Whistledown's 
uh, scandal sheet for shacking <laughs> up with whoever he was shacking up with. Um, and for the rest of them, I'd say it's more notoriety, which I don't know how you would, uh, how that would fit in your system of uh, fame. But um, yeah, they were, they were getting renown amongst fashionable society, at least for all the wrong things. Um, yeah. Well, what, what is celebrity, Greg? What is fame and celebrity in the 18th, 19th century, the Regency period? Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you okay. could never bore us. You could never bore us. It's absolutely I will, not true. I will try and give you the sort of absolute speedy version. Um, I define celebrity as having five checkpoints. You've got to, you've got to tick all five boxes. Um, that means being known to uh, strangers. Um, that needs to be achieved through the work of the media. Um, you need to have personal charisma, so a unique um, identity that is distinctively you. Um, the fourth thing is really important. That people need to be fascinated by the private life, not simply the things you do professionally, but the, your, your love life, your involvement, who are you dating, who are you seeing. And the fifth and most important of all, I would argue, is there needs to be a commercial economy attached to that person's fame. So arguably a parasitic economy, an economy where other people can make money from the celebrity's fame. So celebrities don't always make money for themselves. This is something we think of as um, being a celeb is glamorous and you make a lot of money. Actually, I would argue that celebrity is an economic system where it can be done to you. So other people can make money from debating you, discussing you, gossiping about you, and you might not make anything off it at all. So those are the five checkpoints. And if you don't touch those five, you don't get to be in my book. And oh my uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's a complicated thing because I'd argue that David Attenborough is not a celebrity and people kind of go, what are you talking about? He's incredibly famous. And I go, yeah, not a celebrity. So yeah. there's, there's rules I think that you have to apply, but that's me trying to create a rubric that I could apply as a historian. And so there are others who disagree with me and I think that's absolutely fine. It's great to have disagreement. And that's fascinating, isn't it? Your point about the economy. Obviously this is the world of commerce. The 18th century post-industrial yeah. revolution is when shopping, when commerce, when the empire, including enslavement, when this mm -hmm. becomes, you know, Britain becomes an economic powerhouse. And as you say, celebrity is monetized. Uh, Emma Hamilton, uh, of course, my first book, you know, she was such a celebrity, but it wasn't her who made the money out of the pictures of her and no. the versions of her, the discussions of her. Whereas obviously nowadays, hopefully celebrities are much, you know, much, much, they can make money out of the pack shots and pictures and make restaurants so hopefully it's changed to a degree but it's certainly an, ec an economic system that some people get very rich out of and some people even those who are the famous ones simply don't yeah and even today i you know a line i would make is i'd say that celebrity is a billion pound industry in which celebrities can make millions so you have to think of them as cogs in a huge machine and it's the same in the 18th century there were very rich celebrities in the 18th century who made fantastic amounts of money and bought very fancy houses and wore beautiful clothes um but there were also impoverished ones and there were those who were talked about rather than you know they, some of them were quite canny and and you know did the talking too and placed gossip stories in the newspapers uh, under the names of their friends but um celebrity is a it's a much more capacious and broad and complicated subject than simply what we might think it is now. And, and Emily, talking of money, I mean, the Byrons really weren't that good with money, were they? There's a lot of spending and excessive spending and loss of money going on, isn't there? Yes. I mean, the poet at one point says that the financial dissipation is an epidemic in their family. I, I don't know. Like, I wonder how much he's just justifying his own bad behaviour there, to be honest. But it does reflect throughout, I mean, the 18th century and going back into the 17th century as well. They're just, for the most part, quite dreadful. Um, more concerned <laughs> with uh, uh, following their pleasures, shall we say, than um, thinking about the future. Not very forward looking. No, no, no kind of thinking about mortgages or pension plans, really. It's no, there's no pension plans, is there? It's, it's not really their scene. <laughs> But, and you know, people like so the, a, a story I really enjoyed in the book was Jack and Lady Carmarthen. I mean, that is a story mm. of serious amounts of money spending, isn't it? Can you tell us a bit about that story? Well, um, Jack is the father of the poet, and this is before the poet's existence. Um, and it's he, he's in his early twenties, and he basically falls in with. Uh, an older, slightly older, married marchioness. She's got children. She's married to someone who's going to become the Duke of Leeds. Like this is a huge deal. She's set for life, basically. Yeah, but there's she something. Married well. <laughs> I know, but there's something about Jack Byron. I don't know, swaggering about in the military camps, apparently, um, that just caught her fancy. And 
the brilliant thing about this case is that uh, her husband goes off um, doing military work in Yorkshire, I think, and she's just bringing Jack in through the front door. He'll just waltz in their house and uh, he's found snoring in her bed by the chambermaids and uh, swaggering around with no britches on in the <laughs> library, I think. Um, and it's just we, we get such a great view from this scandal of adultery at this time because it goes to a divorce case and all this dirty laundry gets aired in public and is printed and uh, everyone's snapping up copies of, of this trial and um, eventually the divorce does go through and then Jack marries her and uh, the product is Augusta uh, Lee as we tend to know her who's the elder half-sister of the poet so um, it doesn't really have a happy ending for anyone I don't think apart from Augusta who exists because of it <laughs> but so um, <laughs> Because because late um, later come it's fascinating what you write about the divorce, which is obviously so rare at the time, isn't it? Divorce, mm. and so she sacrificed, and she has to sacrifice for it. She has to sacrifice her reputation. When you think how hard it is for the Prince of Wales to divorce his wife, you know the Lady mm. Carmarthen has to agree and has to agree for all her dirty laundry to be out there. All this you know, proof of adultery, which involves servants talking about what they've seen. and yeah. But that's the price she pays to be able to marry the man. Yes, and she gives up custody of her children to do that. And, and the really unusual thing, like I think she must have been totally in love with uh, who becomes known as Mad Jack Byron posthumously, because I've read the letters from uh, her husband to her in the aftermath of finding about the affair and he is so nice to her and he's giving her he's letting her have all the jewels of like as trinkets yes. of their happier days and I just I mean I don't like her very much but <laughs> on reading those letters so I it must have been on her part at least at first she must have been totally into Jack Byron and then, and then they had Augusta, obviously the famous half sister of, of of the poet, and then she died. Um, Amelia, the lady, yes, yeah, Carmarthen, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, she died. And and this is another. This is one of the examples of things that, with the celebrity of the poet, much decades later, we know we know a lot of it from the sort of veil of myth that grows up around him because of his fame, and he. Uh, sort of battered away accusations that she had died of a broken heart because of his father um, and all these all these myths about the family rose up because their descendant their poet poetic descendant was so famous um, so yeah my research has been a lot of digging under what actually was true and what came because of the poet and then what became after the poet died and the poet himself could really very rarely be trusted on things he was saying. So his own <laughs> contributions uh, not useful either. Uh, we, uh, we've got to talk about the poet. He's, he's, the, he's the elephant <laughs> in the movie, isn't he? The, the poet. I was thinking about the, when he, the elephant's crushing his heart when he says he's heartbroken. Greg, mm. you're the poet. So he is he is pure celebrity, isn't he? The poet. Yeah. Byron. Yeah. I mean, uh, so we obviously we call him Lord Byron. Uh, his name is George Gordon Byron, later George Gordon Noel Byron, because he goes for all sorts of name rebrands. Um, he's sort of like Madonna. Um, he is, um, he's a really complicated character. I think actually it's quite easy and it's quite fun, in fact, to just sort of um, squish him into a very single, small idea of mad, bad, dangerous to know, a man who sort of shanked his way around Europe in a very naughty way. He's, he's very, very sort of sexualized and, and dangerous and pouty and and kind of gothic in our imagination he's actually a very complicated contradictory likable hateable kind of guy he's he's got an awful lot of hidden depths and um and one of the most important things really is that he is born sort of into poverty really in some ways his his dad has thrown away all the family cash um his mum's not very nice uh he's born with a disability he has what's called a club foot we might not say it's that now but he he has chronic pain uh he limps quite severely his his um his calf muscles are much more much smaller on the on the weakened leg uh his foot turns over he walks upon the side of his foot um and he is sort of bounced around between scotland and england he doesn't really know who he is very much he's got a strong scottish accent initially and then at sort of the age of 10 or so he suddenly inherits this random 
family um, in sort of ennoblement, this title, but he inherits a sort of beautiful property that is not really in great nick. It's a bit ramshackle and disheveled and old, and I'm sure Emily can tell us more about it. But Newstead is, you know, now we look at it as sort of the gothic seat of this great poet, but actually he's a 10-year-old boy turning up. He's never really been there before. Um, and his his mum's not the, not the kindest. So it's kind of a, a weird start to life for him. And he only really finds himself, I think, probably at school. He goes to Harrow uh, after the age of 10 or so and becomes a no noble. And that's sort of where he starts to find his feet. And yes, Emily, so who is the poet to you? He's, we, we have, you've set him in context of this family. There was scandal in his family you know, long before he was even born. Absolutely. I mean, um, he's obviously a fascinating character. As Greg said, he's very contradictory. He's often very, remains parts of his life, very controversial um, difficult to un unpack. Um, and obviously hugely fascinating. But what I wanted to do with my research and with my book was to try and understand uh, the impact that his ancestry might have had on him, because that tends to be packed into a page and a half at the beginning of Byron biographies, and it has been since the 1820s, um, all very caricatured. And he had such a strong affinity with history in general, with his ancestors and with Newstead Abbey in particular. Um, it, it, I, I mean, I, I think it was quite formative for him. Obviously, there were other things like his, his disability and um, uh, not classic born and bred nobleman childhood, as Greg no. says. Um, that will all have impacted on, on how he felt being launched into fashionable society. But um, he's one of a long line for me, I would say. He's not the uh, be all and end all. And, and, you know, what about his attitude to women? He's, it's, uh, you know, he, he's, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this to both of you. So he is a man, he is a man who, well, is, it, is his attitude to women, is it, is it, is it cruel? What do you think, Emily? Well, how would you characterise him? It is one of the things that I think I struggle with uh, the most and that I'm asked by people who, like, why are you, why are you studying Lord Byron then? Wasn't he the worst? <laughs> and I just think, uh, well, he was not great uh, in his treatment of women um, if he'd gone off them. Um, yeah. He had quite misogynist tendencies in his writing about them if they're not in the room, which I think is uh, quite telling. Um, obviously generally known for his affairs with married women, uh, thinking of Caroline Lamb, where it goes wrong, uh, not very uh, delicately handled on either side there. Um, so I, I think it is part of his uh, reputation of his, I, I'm trying to think of a different word than mystique, but um, it, it, it's part of what built into his renown I think and the reason why women wrote their fan mail to him in their droves um, it's that classic sort of dodgy aristocratic bad boy that people want to reform and this is something that comes up again <laughs> and again in the letters that are sent to him about all oh, I understand you no one else could we could be together and uh, you know I'll sort you out and Anna Annabella <laughs> Milbank was a bit like that as well I think she was nursing hopes of um, bringing him back to yes, Venus. that didn't work, did it? Um, but well, no. um, yeah, I mean, Annabella was his, his uh, wife, and that's that's a, a marriage that fails almost immediately. Um, I mean, he's 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 a complicated character in a lot of ways. So the first thing to say about him, obviously, he is he's bisexual. He always has been from young age. So at, at fifteen or so, he was in love with boys and girls. Um, he was probably sexually assaulted at 10 by a, a woman, by his nursemaid, which, uh, you know, we don't know what effect that can have, but obviously that's that's a traumatic thing to happen. Uh, in later life, he's a seducer. He's a, he loves to love and he loves to be loved. Uh, he gets bored very easily. He likes older women. He likes younger women. He likes younger boys. He likes, you know, he's he likes skinny, glamorous people. He likes dark haired people. He doesn't like blondes. Um, he's very opinionated. Uh, he hates to watch women eat. Uh, <laughs> But he also has an eating disorder himself. So there's a sort of sense that we look at him and, you know, he has a real problem with his weight. He, he feels overweight. He goes to these extreme kind of fitness regimes and detoxes and fastings in order to lose lots of weight. Um, so he has a real problem watching 
ladies eat, which is a sort of thing that men did at the time as well. He's not the only one. So yeah, he is kind of creepy. He is a, he's problematic. And um, we know he seduces over 250 women in Italy alone, many of whom are married. Um, so like he's not, you know, he would be cancelled if he was on Twitter today. Um, yeah, at the same time, he's a lot more emotionally open than you might expect. Uh, he's a lot more sort of in love with these people, even if it's a temporary thing. Um, he's very honest with them. He keeps telling them his deep, deep, his darkest secrets. And some of them use that against him. You know, Caroline Lamb um, and his wife, Annabella, they use his, his honesty against him to destroy his reputation. And it's the reason he has to go into exile. So, yeah, problematic, but complicated, I think. It's fun. And of course, one consequence of that fascinating consequence is how his daughter Ada is persuaded against poetry and against the arts, isn't he? And towards the science and becomes, a, a, but, but even though she's got this creative, amazing imagination, she, she has, she becomes, you know, it, it's so infamous in history as, uh, as, as, move, as, as developing the first computer, uh, the brilliant Ada Lovelace. And, you know, Emily, well, one thing I really loved about your book was Newstead Abbey, the, you, how you brought it to life. It was almost like a character in your book and the, the servants in Newstead Abbey. You, you, we've introduced it a little bit, talking about how Byron inherited it at the age of 10. Could you talk a bit more about Newstead Abbey and what it meant to the family? Yes, well, it was, it was definitely a huge inspiration for the young 10-year-old who arrives there in 1798 and he's just inherited this whacking great place near Nottingham. And um, he, both he and his mum uh, just fall in love with the place completely. And the solicitor who's there is really surprised because the, there are the straw everywhere and there's cattle down in the basement area and everything's falling in and, and all of this. But he is totally enchanted by it. And it, we see it infuse some of his very earliest poetry. Quite a lot of his early um, you know, teen verses are about his ancestry and the ghosts that are haunting Newstead and watching him and he's the last of the line and all of this kind of gloomy wow. um, stuff but I mean one thing that was really useful for me um, in writing my book is that it's just a really neat metaphor for what is happening to the whole family over the course of the 18th century so when it is inherited by the poet's predecessor the fifth lord in 1736 it's it's Obviously, um, it's got this character of being built from the ruins of an old priory, but it's in pretty good nick and it's full of uh, amazing artistic masterpieces and visitors are coming from all over the country and, and calling it one of the best collections they've seen. Beautiful, um, characterful place. But when the fifth Lord takes over, um, he really hasn't got very much... Uh, care for the future he's just been given this money and he wants to make a name for himself he wants to have fun he wants to consort with actresses and join the freemasons and uh, do a bit of pub stabbing um and that's what he does and he, he runs through <clears throat> the byron fortune he marries a very wealthy young heiress he runs through her fortune almost immediately as well and then um they end up separating so uh by the end of his life he he is a wreck of a man. Nobody likes him. Um, and Newstead has fallen from this amazing mansion to um, all everything's been auctioned off. And, uh, you know, people are paying him to keep their livestock inside the building. So um, that's what the poet inherits. And that's why it uh, what captures his imagination, I suppose. It's fascinating the way you write about it. And I'm, um, you know, obviously when, when, when in the summer, hopefully when we can all travel around but much, more, much more, I'm dying to go and look at it again, you know, thinking about what you wrote about it. I, I just, mm. you really brought it to life. And um, there's a great quote in your book um, that was, that pleased the Byrons, didn't it? Isn't, is it not enough the Byrons all excel as much as fighting and in loving well? Now, how true was that? Oh, I'm sure they went all in for it. I'm sure they wanted it to be uh, a perfect representation. Yeah, so that I, I think is from around, it's from the 17th century. I think it's for the third Lord Byron. So it's slightly pre um, my family that I focus on. But I love that that existed 150 years before uh, the poet was romping around. And uh, certainly with the poet's grandfather, he had the exact same reputation. He joined the Navy. He was oh, yes. a, a record-breaking explorer. Um, and in the 1770s, he 
ditched his wife briefly and um, ran off with uh, one of the chambermaids. And this made it into the Town and Country magazine scandal sheet, which is like the lady whistle down thing. Um, <laughs> and that was basically a catalogue of his sexual adventures um, around the world as he's traveling around uh, su seducing Italian landladies and people of all sorts of indigenous cultures um, and obviously young teenage servants as well. So um, the grandfather goes in for it and then obviously the poet I'm sure uh, picked up on that one as well. So, so the grandfather was really notorious and obviously involved in this sort of exploitation, uh, at, you know, across across the world. So, there's so many notorious characters in Byron's history. Uh, and but it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because so often in the period, it's only the men who get to do scandalous activities. Because you say there's this huge double standard: men can do whatever they want, but a woman who has had an, has an affair is uh, is is very castigated. Completely, what you talk about with Lady Carmarthen. And also, mm -hmm. you know, Isabella really breaking, you know, I, I know that Isabella is one of your favorite characters in the book, yeah. how she really breaks out of the very strict, when you read very strict expectations of what a woman should be. Yes, I mean, I was thinking about this and Isabella is basically Lydia Bennett in her 50s, I think. <laughs> and that she, is cool. She retains it and, and her, her favorite adventure of mine is, as I say, she goes off to Europe because her husband, her second husband has just proved too boring. Um, and she shacks up basically with this uh, soldier who she then, they go off traveling to Switzerland, to Lake Geneva um, and then to Italy. And then they decide that they'll just pass him off as an aristocrat and start introducing him as a German baron. But he is, they are both booted out in the end because his behavior apparently is too uncouth and people clock on that he, he's not a German aristocrat at all. Um, and she, she manages to drag this out for 15 years before she's brought back to England in disgrace. So um, I quite admire that, really. <laughs> so, so she, she took this guy around the royal courts of Europe, didn't some, some royal courts, yeah. didn't she? Yeah. She, this is my aristocratic baron. Yeah. All made up. Yeah. Made up. He's, he was just a soldier and he was leeching off her awfully. I mean, he was essentially a con man and her family could see this. Everyone back in England could see this, but she was... Um, I mean, he apparently wasn't even that handsome. She, she said he was the politest man in the world and everyone oh. else said he was a boar and a horse. So uh, <laughs> the, the heart always can't see, can I it? Know, yeah, I know, I know. You know. And, by, and, you know, Greg, are we attracted... When we think about celebrity and fame and those who often become particularly celebrated in, in, in culture, are we attracted to those who have a self-destructive streak or like, like the Byron the Poet, die young? Yeah, I mean... As I said before, celebrity is an economic system, so it can it can be kind of anything. And you get there's plenty of heroic celebrities in the certainly in the 19th century, your Mary Seacoles and your Grace Darlings and your Florence Nightingales. But um, if you remember the sort of my my annoying checklist, um, the fourth of those is that there has to be a fascination with the personal life, the private life. And if you think about celebrity as a sort of human soap opera, someone who is constantly producing new, exciting dramatic things they've done that week which you know it, almost like switching onto your favorite show and, and seeing oh, what they've done now oh great fantastic i can't believe he's dating her so there is a sense that a celebrity has to they've got to have a kind of momentum and they've got to have a sort of ongoing buzz and if you do the same thing over and over it gets quite boring so part of the part of the kind of dynamic that gives fame its exciting revelatory gossip mongering kind of energy is the scandalous novelty of constantly new th I mean the word news tells us you know news means new things and we love new things um so byron at the poet is one of the reasons he's so beloved and so hated simultaneously is that he's always on to the next thing he's always getting married and then suddenly he's not married anymore suddenly he's he's off he's doing this he's written this he's written that he's insulting this person he's turned up over here he's boxing with that person um and dying young helps in a kind of posthumous sense you know there's there's two sort of separate things here really isn't there kate we've got the kind of celebrity which is the lived celebrity the kind of people that you can go and see day in day out that you can read about them in the newspapers and then you've got the posthumous reputation and this is where the complexity comes in this is where the the confusion arrives because that's traditionally what people would call fame so posthumous posthumous reputation usually is called fame and it's a it's derived from the roman and the greek use of the word pharma 
which derives from the Latin uh, feme or fame, which means to be spoken of. It derives from fari, to be on the tongue. And actually, that's a misunderstanding of it. The, the Romantic poets, your Shelleys, your Keats, your Byrons, um, they understood fame to be something that happened to you after you died. And they enjoyed that. They embraced that. They, they welcomed it. They wanted to be famous after they were gone. But when we go and look at Roman and Greek sources, particularly Roman sources, particularly Virgil, we see actually that that Virgil understood completely that celebrity and fame, well, or rather fame, could happen in your lifetime. It could be horrific and terrifying and scary. And fame was a monster. So, um, you know, fame in the, in the classical sense is like a sort of giant Godzilla covered with tongues and ears and mouths. And, and she stalks you. She's a monster. She's a beast. She doesn't sleep. She grows bigger. Uh, her head's into the clouds and she finds you and she hunts you down. So to be spoken of, fari, to be on people's tongue is to be kind of both like beloved and also hated and so the dying young thing kate is a really interesting challenge because that that gets us into a, a different idea that gets us into a classical notion of fame that is misunderstood and it's slightly different to celebrity but it does matter of course it does and byron dying at 36 the poet dying at 36 does affix him as a young man uh, even though by that point he was graying and he was he gained weight again he was not very well anymore he still in our head is a young man and Keats dies at 25, which of course is much, much younger. And it, it, yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? How those who die young are really affixed in our, in our consciousness is always young and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting the comparison with Keats, isn't it? Because in terms of reputation, Byron, we might argue was much more celebrated at the time, yeah. but it's Keats yeah. and Shelley uh, and Wordsworth who are the romantic poets, I think that are more, most likely to be known about and studied and talked about in, in modern culture now. And, and why do we think that is that perhaps Byron's poetry has lost a bit over the years? That's such a great question. And I think um, the, the truth is, is that Byronic poetry is long. <laughs> it's, he's, he's, a, he's, like, he's a waffler. He likes to chat. Um, and, <laughs> you know, uh, he, he, writes, he writes in what's called Spenserian stanzas, uh, which is named after the 16th century poet uh, Edmund Spencer, who wrote Fairy Queen. And so it's a very specific style. But he wrote these great epic poems. Um, Child Harold Pilgrimage is his first, his first great hit. And then you've got the Corsair and you've got the Jawa, these sort of hits that are kind of big and grand and glamorous and long and no narrative, essentially. They're, they're storytelling. Whereas, of course, Keats and Shelley and, and um, sort of Southey and, and Wordsworth are writing short, you know, memorable poems we can recite, we can learn when we're 10 years old at school and kind of, you know, there's lines that you can re recall, but it's important to know that at the time Byron's poetry was recalled by people. People were obsessed with his poetry. He was the most famous poet in Europe, bar none. And when he died, when the news reached Britain, there's all these stories of servants and lords gathering around the table and just reciting their favorite bit. So he was beloved as a writer at the time, although he was despised as an individual. Um, but history then wasn't tremendously kind to him as a creative. And there was a real back and forward on his legacy as to whether he was a great writer or not. And to a certain extent, he's dated. He's a bit dated and he's just quite hard to read now, even though I think actually it's quite fun to read it. If you know a bit about his life, it comes alive. It really, You can really see him in it and you can see the the, the kind of the personal in his writing. But if you don't know anything about him, it's very arcane and quite tricky to get into. Fascinating. Emily, you were saying, Newstead Abbey, which, as I said, I just love the way you talked about the family, that the ghosts, Byron in his juvenilia, his early writing, which I know you've read so much of, which I don't think any, um, lots of us, I don't know anything of, and I'm sure lots of people watching haven't read either. He talks a lot about the ghosts in, he sees the ghosts of his ancestors. And what, what you know, you, you give the incredible story of his family here. And what, do you think what kind of impact do you think having ancestors of these kind of stories would have had on him? Yes, I, I do. I do think that they were um, they were formative in that we can see them. He carries them throughout his life. If if they'd only just come up in his sort of uh, juvenilia um, poems, I would think, oh, this is a young boy looking at a big castle and thinking, oh, this is mine, hooray! Um, <laughs> but but he throughout his life he returns to the stories from his ancestry. Uh, he sticks a newstead in so many of his um, epic poems. And, you know, when he goes off eventually and, and joins the Greek struggle for independence, he has got his 
family uh, motto blazoned on his big plumed helmet in uh, Byronic style. So I think he feels that he does carry them throughout his life. Um, but yes, I, I would agree with Greg that that a lot of his poetry now can seem a bit in, impenetrable to, to the modern reader. But I would say that um, a great thing to do is to get an audio book if anyone's interested in listening to the poetry I feel like that's certainly I was able to connect to it a lot more easily um, by listening to it rather than just reading it off the page um, so yeah I think that's that's what I would say to anyone who's wanting to maybe learn a bit of the poetry and we just got a few seconds left before I turn to my <laughs> wonderful audience question so anyone in the audience who wants to send in a question you know now is your last chance type quickly um so just before we move on to these fantastic audience questions Emily you know as I was saying I just I I, I, I feel like I've, I've lived some of the book with you I don't know it's an <laughs> odd thing to say because I saw all your archives and all the all the letters you were talking about all you know and I was so excited when it came out and I know you've been to so many archives read so many original letters that no, people have never read before do you have a favorite letter in all the ones you've read um oh this is this is tricky I mean I love the John Murray archive which is up in Edinburgh um because it is full of so much material culture as well as just the letters so there's bits of Byron's bed curtain supposedly <laughs> and uh and the fan mail and his passport um and thankfully not Caroline Lamb's pubic hair, as far as I saw. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> order that one up, but it's probably somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, um, but I loved to find the love letters from Isabella to her second husband. And thankfully, her boring second husband was a historian and Ooh. kept kept all of the letters in chronological order and then put his little notes about them in the margins and um so their whole relationship was laid out over over the course of 10 years from their secret engagement to um his little obituary for her and that was just amazing because that's not been published anywhere before um so I, that was my most exciting moment at Gloucester Archives. Shout out to Gloucester Archives. That is exciting. That is so <laughs> exciting, isn't it? We're so grateful as historians, aren't we, to all the archivists who do all this work and you know yes. and we're really so grateful to them um and um well that gosh I mean just I've just my mind is blown by all this fascinating stuff and I feel like I've got the ghosts of Byron in my house with me I feel like they're all they're all here <laughs> I hope not me. Kate they're, these are these are very <laughs> tricky so excited. It's, been, to you. it's been it's a fascinating <laughs> so I'm just going to turn some of our, our audience questions here it, it's uh, it has some, so many questions I don't think I can get through all of them but we've got some really fascinating questions here and um one of them here is what how did Byron act around his contemporaries like Shelley and Wordsworth do you, and do we think the fame <laughs> boosted his ego or changed his character or were they kind of interchangeable oh he's a monster <laughs> <laughs> he is um one of the complexities of, of Byron is that he has extremely close loyal friends from Cambridge um and they are his sort of gang is his buddies they are they're going to stay with him his whole life pretty much um and then he's got his professional associates who he is constantly at, at war with and rivaling with he hates salvi who poet laureate um he thinks wordsworth is a prig and a boring old windbag uh he thinks yeah. uh you know shelley he likes mostly but you know he thinks he's better than shelley uh, keats he calls a cockney oik um who sort of writes, you know, I don't know if I can say the word, but he, you know, yeah, he's fairly rude about his his uh, style of poetry. Um, <laughs> he thinks he's the greatest and he thinks that other people aren't quite as good as him. And he, you know, his second ever book when he's 21 years old is a devastating critique of the critique of, of the critics and the writers of, of England and Scotland who have savaged his first book. So at 21, he already burns his bridges and goes after his enemies. So that's sort of... He could be kind, he could be generous, he could be supportive, but he is, he's an egotist. Yeah, he's not the one to go for a blurb for your latest poetry book, is he? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh God, can you imagine here, the buyer on the back of the book, like, this is awful. Why would you, yeah, why would you read this? Read me. Yes. <laughs> and so, and, and um, Emily, you know, I had just, just a question. We, we were talking a bit about his cruelty towards women. Um, how, how typical of, of Byron's behaviour and, and some of obviously his um, relations behaviour, how typical of that is of contemporary masculinities or is it part of this wider, wider behaviour of a celebrity? Did Byron get away with it because he was Byron or because he was a man? 
Um, I, I, that's a tricky question. I think that we have so much evidence left of what Byron thought and what he was doing because of his fame that it's, it's, you know, it's easy to attach it to just him. Um, I think that he may be, that there are, ev there is evidence of him being pretty cruel about, about women and, and dropping them very easily as we've talked about. Um, I'm sure that there's part of him getting away with his gallantries because he's a man also because he's a very handsome young man uh with a title i think that has got to play into it as well his father showed a lot of the same impulses um from what we can tell from the contemporary evidence he was his jack's letters are awful um in their cruelty i'd say they surpass the poet uh in terms of boasting about kicking female servants down the stairs um and sleeping with whoever he can sleep with and all of this so that really comes through in his father's letters as well which I think is quite interesting um there are there's an endless string of awful men I think of this time <laughs> um and being a man of that rank as well of course you you're bound to get away with much more than you would as as women for sure Fascinating. Um, Greg, I've had a lot of questions about your about your the, the, your sort of ca, ca, um, your sort of rules of being a celebrity. Uh oh, I've had, here quite, we go. I've had yeah. quite a few questions. <laughs> it really stimulated a really exciting debate here. But one I'm going to just start with is um, just a really interesting question here. Were there any people in history you were going to put into your book into into Dead Famous, of course, but did not because they didn't reach your criteria for, for the didn't reach your criteria? Oh yeah, hundreds. I mean, there are there are 125 people in the book, and I could have put easily another 500 in, no problem. But there were several hundred I couldn't. That's put volume in. two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dead famous two, uh, the vengeance. Um, but um, yeah, it's a very, it's a re you know, to be blunt about it, being a historian, sometimes you have to be confident in being able to stand up and defend your argument. And I just had visions of myself getting up at, you know, book festivals or doing talks like this and sort of going, this person was a celebrity and thinking, I don't think that's true. So I, the people in the book are people I am 100% categorically confident were celebrities. They ticked all five boxes. There are some people who you could make the argument for, and you could sneak them in and you might just have a case and potentially um, the poet's grandfather is one of them and you know, it's, it's a fun discussion to have and there are certainly like Roman charioteers that I you know I explored the idea of, of gladiators and charioteers you know they were so famous they were so well known people knew their names but was there a commercial economy no there wasn't we don't have the evidence for it so they can't quite go in so uh, yeah it's a frustrating game but it's a fun game actually and it's a game you can play actually you, you know I said already David Attenborough is not a celebrity but he is one of the most renowned people in our land you know he's the most perhaps respected of all of our our public figures but he's not a celebrity um and there are lots of people like that actually that if you start the game it's quite good fun so um tonight if you're bored uh and you don't want to watch the news then um, why not play the game of celeb or not uh which uh, amuses the family for hours the country's <laughs> children to drop roblox and now play that instead that's really exactly. what's much more fun <laughs> and that, that and fascinating and, and just i've just uh, got time i think just for one more um uh, Emily, you know the the, po the poet um, had very sympathetic politics, we might say, to to those who were dispossessed in society, but combines this with a very callous attitude towards those he encounters. Uh, that's quite a contradiction, isn't it? Yeah, I think that sums up how difficult it is to figure him out um, and deal with him at all. To be honest, he he when he was young, I think he was very enthusiastic about the idea of getting involved in politics and reform, and uh, he. He only gave three speeches as um, a peer in the House of Lords, but they were all, um, you know, they were they were leaning towards the sympathetic for the common man and pointing out that um, they are the backbone of the country. Um, but then there's this huge contradiction that people were very keen to point out is that he is speaking of equality and then swanning about with a, a Napoleonic style carriage and a menagerie of animals um, living very extravagantly. So it's something that was leveled at him when he was alive and it's quite difficult to reconcile them now I think yeah. as well for sure. Fantastic well thank you to our wonderful audience for your questions sorry we couldn't get through them all I've had so many fantastic ones and we're just about to finish but just before we do I just have two 
kind of fun questions just to finish it off. And my first one is to Greg, and that was, what would Byron be like on Twitter, Greg? Oh, my goodness. He'd be an absolute handful. I mean, I'd, it would be amazing. Locked, um, banned? <laughs> uh, his, his, his publisher, John Murray, his friends were always telling him, don't say that, cut that out. They were always editing his poems, always saying, you can't say that, that's libelous, you can't say that. So first and foremost, he'd be constantly causing problems he'd be fun though because he would be occasionally you'd find yourself on the same side of the argument and sometimes you'd find yourself on the opposite because he you know he's the defender of the common man and the radicalism and at the same time he was a, a, a you know a toff uh he would be very unpredictable but yeah he'd always be in trouble definitely be posting at 2 a.m something, yeah. <laughs> something really objectionable uh for sure and emily just two quick questions to you number one i'm going away my cats need house sitting who of the byrons is the only is the is the most responsible house and plant and cat sitter we've got any of them this the augusta it's got to be the half sister i mean she apart from her uh <laughs> pretty reputed affair with byron apart from that she was quite solid reliable. she's my cat sitter right yeah, i've got it so. <laughs> and i just i just love the book so much just gonna wave it again i absolutely love it recommend it to anyone who's anyone who hasn't already got it and it really is like a movie it reads like a movie it, it, you know I, I just see it as a new netflix biopic and you know <laughs> in the netflix biopic who will play isabella do we have any who's your dream actress to play isabella um I've been pondering this for years now and I am taking suggestions um so if anyone has any please tweet them at me um I've I've got stuck on Kate Winslet oh yes um I I love her um and I and I just want to see I would like Isabella to be portrayed as a more mature romping woman having adventures not a 19 year old with an older man because that was not her at all she'd be the 50 year old with a 22 year old soldier on her arm so <laughs> Well, Someone who can do that. Oh God! Well, that, well, I'm I'm gripped, and I hope that we will, Emily. You'll get us all. Me, me, and Greg rolls as extras. We can kind of wave at a <laughs> ball or something and look very natural. Um, but yeah, it's no been <laughs> just a small ask. Uh, it's been so wonderful. Thank you so much to our wonderful audience for coming. We really appreciate your company, and it's been so great to have you here with Histfest. And I'm just so grateful to the amazing Emily and the amazing Greg, the authors of these two brilliant books, uh, for giving so much time and so much generosity all this time. And, you know, thank you so much to our wonderful interpreter. I know I speak very fast and I'm very grateful. And thank you <laughs> to our fantastic captioner as well. They've done so much in the British Library for hosting us. So thank you for coming all. Do follow Greg and Emily on Twitter. Their, their Twitter feeds are an absolute delight and Instagram. Uh, subscribe <laughs> to You're Dead to Me and do go and buy the books at the, at the History uh, Fest bookshops because they are, are truly wonderful and I, and I won't regret it. And you, you want to get them read before, before the Netflix biopic comes out. And thank you again. <laughs> so much to Greg and Emily for all your all your all your generosity with your time and your thoughts and thank you all for coming we so appreciate it thank you to you our audience for joining us today and a special thanks to today's panelists as well please do remember to send feedback if you can and also check out the British Library's what's on pages to see what other events are coming up please also check out Histfest's website as well, www.histfest.org. Thank you.